Okay. <clears throat> Again, to continue. Trying to be, uh, I'm trying to be, trying to make it cohesive and orderly, but I get carried away by small subjects here and there. So I'm sorry if it's all scattered. Um, dharma. The word Dharma, the Sanskrit word Dharma is just incredible. It has too many meanings. I think at the least it has supposedly have 10 different meanings. One being the truth that we have been talking. The other is Lam or Thikpa, which is in, an interesting word. Sometimes we also, in the Sanskrit, it's, uh, the term is Yana, Yana, Thikpa, which is loosely translated as vehicle. You need to pay attention to this word vehicle because we are talking about a temporary usage, something that you use temporarily, something that you use it till wherever you want to, you know, there is, you know, the, the purpose of vehicle is, you know, and the moment the phenomena of the vehicle is mentioned, obviously you need to talk about the end, the result, you know, the destination. If there's no destination, then the vehicle is useless. So, this destination is uh, really important. We really need to contemplate on this one. Um, using the vehicle, the yana, mahayana, sharvaka yana, avajaryana, tantriyana, mantrayana, whatever yana you are using. There are many yanas, by the way. Um, The destination, it's important to contemplate. Um, in Tibetan, we categorize the destination into two. We call it ngunto na ngelek. The ngunto means something like, I think we already talked about it this morning, higher realm, lofty level, you understand? You know, I was giving the example of all kinds of examples, ngunto. And this Munto, the lofty realm, the lofty situation, the higher realm, that's sort of under, that's sort of fathomable. We can fathom it. This is even though I was sort of joking this morning, it's not don't take it too like I don't know. Um, Take it seriously a little bit. You know, it's, it's, it is kind of a serious. So when we are talking about Ngunto, we are talking about having a good Panadol, the higher realm. Shower, good car, whatever, you know, good political system. It really um, <clears throat> is a fathomable. Now that is something that we can fathom, most of us. Now, even there, you have to pay some attention. Many, many, even within the Buddhist, can't really fathom these, these state beyond this life. So, even within the Buddhists, many people only think about what we call um, uh, we call it tsural tonga, tsural tonga, which means you know, tsural means sort of okay, um, within this, you know, you know, a certain boundary. Let's say a boundary. There's a, let's say there's a boundary, 
So all we see is within this boundary, within this box, within this zone. You don't go really, you don't really think about beyond this box, beyond this zone. It's unfathomable for most of us. So this is why the question, that you need to really seriously ask this question, is enlightenment attractive for you? <coughs> yes, and a good panadol shop is very attractive if you have headache problem. Good, you know, good political system, good highways. It is very attractive. But enlightenment, it's unfathomable. Things that we are supposedly want and need is unfathomable. This is something that you need to think about it. Because we are, at the end of the day, we are what I call sosuchyo. Sosuchyo. Tsurul tonga. Sosuchyo. Okay, tsurul tonga. The beings who only think within this box. Ordinary, I think sometimes sosichyo, sosichyo is the word in Tibetan we use, is basically common, common, ordinary beings, not sublime beings. So how to define ordinary beings? I was going through some sutras, actually this comes from the sutra, there's a lot of distinctions. Um, I, I just extracted few definition of what is ordinary being. How do you define ordinary being? An ordinary being has always some kind of a same jo, same jo. How do you De depression is not really the right word. Sadness, sadness. There is a there's a sadness and the sutras talk a lot, quite distinct, uh, quite, quite extensively about how and why ordinary beings are sad, sad sadness. Um, I think one sutra talks about 20, 20 reasons why people are, why ordinary beings are sad. Uh, I don't think we can go through all, but let, let's try one, one of uh, several. Okay. Why ordinary beings are sad? Because the ordinary beings have notion of self. We are not even talking about we are not even talking about whether the self is truly existent or not. That's a philosophical people, you know, this is this you learn in the philosophy. But the fact that you have this notion I am me, I, you understand? This makes you sad. And this makes you so sweet. Do you want to go out of the box? Do you want to be extraordinary? Well, if you have that, no, you can't really. You will always be bound by within this box. You will be staying within this realm. You will not go beyond this realm. Just having the notion of self, it's painful, it's, it's sad. Um, just a few more. We can discuss this more ex you know, in detail if you want. Mm, yeah. How do you translate this? Mm. What makes us ordinary being, or a sen sentient being is not right, ordinary being, sosicho. What makes us within this zone? Um, there is always a longing to tame and train. In other words, this is a classic Buddhist word, but in other words, there's always a longing to be better. Does that ring a bell? How many people read self-improvement? <laughs> you understand? I don't know, like, boost your, I don't know, self-esteem. Every book you can buy is about this. 
self-improvement or you understand how to make better friends isn't it <laughs> how to win somebody within seven minutes <laughs> how to you know make three packs <laughs> right three packs how to lose weight how to gain weight how to i don't know all kinds of how to better man manage how there's always this thing about wanting to improve yeah and this is why you are ordinary second reason <laughs> uh, the okay answer to one your and then another reason Papa it's, it's, it comes from a sutra I'm not making these things up please um, it's from a sutra I don't know the Sanskrit name turn Jeva sort of extended meaning or something like that answer too much oh and what make the another reason why we are ordinary is there's always a panic panic by the way, it's a really good for business. Because people have panic. <coughs> Panadol works. Panic. There's always some sort of a is a, is a panic and paranoia similar? Paranoia? I think paranoia is a better word, probably. Paranoia. Paranoia. It doesn't matter what kind of paranoia. Paranoia of, I don't know, Paranoia of not getting attention. Do you know what we do to get attention from other people? Nice perfume. But also some people squeak. <laughs> Have you noticed this? Really, people actually do squeak. Like they talk like this. <laughs> because... <laughs> I'm sorry if there's any Japanese, but in Japan <laughs> there's something called cute culture. Cute culture, I don't know. Kawaii. Kawaii? Kawaii. Hawaii? Kawaii. Kawaii. Yes. Even the way you walk, <laughs> things like this. There's a, the paranoia. And then, of course, now in Korea, there is actually men's saloon where you actually buy, lo not just, it's so many. Those, those are more gross ones. Those are actually almost, I like it. <laughs> it's the squeaking ones. <laughs> and things like that. Oh, you know, people, oh, list goes on. It, sometimes if you like somebody, if you like somebody, to get this person's attention, some people throw tantrums. <laughs> throw tantrums. I don't know whether you have ever noticed this. Tantrums. It's a one really, really good sign of how people are paranoid. Throwing tantrums. You know, if we make a list of this, the, we can do a lot of business in there here, actually. There's, there's a lot of opportunity here. If you s research this paranoia, <laughs> you understand? Mm, people like, laugh like horse. Um, yeah. People, I don't know, take shower too much or all the way to not at all take shower, <laughs> right? <laughs> Stuff like that. Okay, next list. What is it? Mm. Yeah, paranoia. And then, fear. Well, some of these are very, very subtle difference, but important difference. Fear. Fear of unknown. Fear of... Very close to paranoia, but... Mm, okay. To define it more... 
thoroughly. Mm, parano uh, paran um, okay. The earlier one is more actually more based on fear of unknown, the paranoia. The second one, the fear of something known. It's like um, this. Mm. It's like death. Okay, one good example is death and old age. We know we are going to get old. You just, you know, no way out of that. We know we are going to die. I think it happens, especially when you are a person who is second time falling in love. When you are falling in love for the second time with someone else, not the first person. <laughs> oh, also, also first person, why not? But uh, usually the second time. Uh, it's a bit like, mm, you know where it is going to go. <laughs> you understand? You know it's, uh, it's, going to, it's going to lead somewhere. <laughs> You're, and yet, some sort of the force of you know, self-cherishing, self-loving, and uh, all this just push you there and pull you there, and, and yet at the same time you have this fear. This is a very complicated one. I don't know how to explain this properly. But, yeah, there's a lot of that, a lot of that. It's like, it's like you know, um, throwing a big chunk of wasabi in your mouth. You know where th what this is going to do, but you also like it. So it's also a little bit of a, what do you call it, a sadomasochist sort of addiction. You know, there's a little bit, no, uh, masochist, right? Masochist. The, the, the sort of... <coughs> yes. So this, so that. Ah, the, how many? Doesn't matter. Ah, another reason why we are ordinary beings. We just never know. We just don't know the direction, the nature, and direction, the nature, cho, yeah, cho is the direction, nature, and state of fearlessness. We just don't know. We just don't know fearlessness. I think that's simple put it like that. We just don't know fearlessness. This is what makes you ordinary. And then, next one is a very um, uh, you is will be easy for most of you those who have received teachings in, in uh, buddhist teachings Do, you don't know karma someone who doesn't know karma karma can be consequences cause condition and effect the game mm -hmm. game that it plays if you don't know karma the the game of this karma the working of the karma, then you are an ordinary person. Thing is in Mathoba. Another reason why you are uh, ordinary is that you cannot focus, concentrate. Basically, you don't have the power of samadhi. You cannot focus. You cannot, you know, you vibrate. Vibrate, vibrate, flicker. You are like a feather in the wind. It doesn't matter where the wind blows, you will be pushed and pulled. Just unsettling, always. Mm. And this is a little bit complicated. Um, 
It's a little complicated, but important. Whatever ordinary people, like you and me, whatever we do, it actually ends up creating a consequences so that um, it bears a fruit. It's not really, we are not talking about a karma, we are talking about, what do you call it? Um, maybe we are talking more about the karmic consequences. Uh, let me explain this. Um, the present, this moment action. ends up giving a consequence of a pres present of a, the future present future presence so to speak the future okay let's call it future whatever you do now it ends up becoming a cause and condition so that there will be an effect it's a really important one what makes us an ordinary? Mm. I don't know whether this will help. Nagarjuna's letter to his friend, the king, I think there is a one shaloka where Nagarjuna said, everybody is afraid of death, but for me even more, I'm, I'm more afraid to the birth, because it is the birth that leads you to the death. And so the birth gives birth to the birth of death. Whatever we do, whatever, even a mere thinking, gives rise or causes and causes a existence of something. It's quite a complicated but important one. If you understand this then maybe you will have a easier understanding on the Buddhist philosophy the Buddhist concept on time and existence. And then, a very, yeah, this one we talk a lot. Busy. Ordinary people, what makes you an ordinary? You are busy. If you are busy, then you are really ordinary. And many times, also, it's like this. Not only Mm, you are busy, but wishing to be busy. Um, thriving for busyness. Looking for bus being busy. That's another one. And... Um, I don't know, there's too many. Some of them I don't know how to even explain.
Okay, anyway, this makes you sad. This makes you dependent on cause and conditions. And these, if you are subject to this definition, this kind of condition, then you are an ordinary being. Okay, so, um, if you are an ordinary person, then your goal of the path, that's what we have been talking, talking to remember? Your goal of your vehicle, goal of your journey, always end up aiming for something fathomable, something within this zone. Um, so this is why many so-called people who are spiritual, those who does meditation, those who are, you know, embarking on a journey of spirit, journey, the spiritual journey, they have to ask these questions: whether they are, uh, whether they are, whether their goal, whatever it is, whether it's a higher birth or so-called enlightenment, whether it is fathomable with a, as an ordinary being. Okay. Now, Nyelek, I think we have talked enough about this uh, ordinary, um, uh, this, uh, what do you call it, higher, higher state. But how about the liberation? Nirvana. First of all, I've already asked you, do we really want this? Are we attracted attracted to this? Do we want this? Do we like this? And before even answering this question, what do we mean by like and admire? Because our liking and admiring and wanting is fickle. It keeps on changing. It keeps on changing the reference. Usually, Uh, this is I'm continu a few more continuing with ordinary uh, what do you call it? Uh, what makes an ordinary person? Jiksolaga, meaning we like things that are actually transitory, but when they are collected, when they are put together, this little okay, they are all transitory. Okay, they're all like shifting, drifting all the time. They're always moving. They're always shifting all the time. But, what, but we, the ordinary beings, we like not the each and every individual transitory things. We don't. But we like to put them together. Jigsok is like aggregate. We put them together, and then we like the sort of conglomerate or the aggregate or the gathering of transitory collections or the uh, transitory collections. This is another uh, what do you call it um, quality of ordinary being. So, also this is you know I'm defining liking when we say like when we say we want. We, this is what we want. Usually, we want something that something that is transitory collection, and we also have the. Uh, we also like to see illusion as real. This is another. I think this you have heard. Mm. And. We also like things that are sensible, things that are logical, things that are sensible.
But at the same time, we also have this um, habit of not wanting to analyze thoroughly. We only analyze. First of all, we don't analyze. As a, you know, mata mache nyam gawa. We say we do not analyze. We do not uh, what do you call it? Um, scrutinize. We do not um, look close. We just take things at face value. This is uh, what do you call it. This is the habit we have. Okay, so based on this, now think about enlightenment. And this time, I'm going to borrow a little bit of a Vajrayana concept, but I'm not going to name as in the classic tantric text. Would you feel comfortable to date with someone who has two heads? Aren't we more comfortable with uh, being with someone that 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 is something called normal? Familiar shape, familiar height, width, color, quantity, and familiar. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, ingredients, I think. Ingredients. And then also familiar sound, and therefore familiar language, and therefore familiar, what do you call it? Communication ways, ways of the communication. We are fond of this. And we feel comfortable with this. We we feel, um, yeah, we feel comfortable and we feel safe with this. And we like emotions. We are comfortable with the emotions. We cannot fathom a state where there is no emotion. This is un you know, unfathomable. It does not fit with uh, in your mind. Not only we cannot fathom yourself not having emotion, but you will not be able to fathom um, someone else not having emotion. That's like unbearable. Have you read? Philip Dick, right? Philip Dick. Um, what is it? Uh, do the androids dream of electric sheep? Dream electric electric sheep. Have you read that book? No need. No need. It's it's <laughs> it's a very very complicated and very boring in one way, but it's some quite an interesting. I find I think because supposedly. In the future, we are talking about what year. In this is sort of futuristic, and it's, it's quite brilliant actually. This man wrote it like 1950s, right? Yeah. And anyway, supposedly, in the future, there will be no more. Only the very, 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 very wealthy top elite, top wealthy people can own real sheep. As pet, and that's like, or the dog, I guess. <laughs> that's like a luxury. The rest of the you know middle class and the lower class have to do with the android sheep. <laughs> Very interesting, I find. Basically, what I'm trying to say is, we like other people to have emotion.
they, they made a film recently. What is it called? Blade, Blade Runner? Runner? No, the second Blade Runner. 2049? You should watch this. It's quite good. Mm. There's a scene where the man is about to kiss his girlfriend and then the phone rings and then the man sort of touches her, uh, what do you call, it, neck or something and then, you know, because it's an android, it's a, it's a robot, so then she just hangs there, pause, it's like a pause. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I'm just telling you, I'm giving you this because I want you to really think about how much you want the enlightenment. Obviously, I'm not saying that enlightenment state is like you become like a robot. Definitely not. You have kayas and janas, but they say. Like infinite wisdom, infinite you know, manifestations, infinite this and that. But it's not, so it's not really like a robot. But yet we are, not talk, we are talking about a state where there is no time, there is no emotion. So this is something that a path dweller really has to contemplate. And um, let us now continue with what we have been talking. Okay, so Dharma practitioner, aiming for higher birth. We have already talked about generosity, what is it? Discipline and patience. Now, diligence. What is diligence? Diligence is basically which is joy to be virtuous. Again, as someone who is lazy, someone who doesn't have a very, very high aim, someone who just wants to have a higher rebirth, if you want to have that kind of experience, then creating the joy for virtue, joy for wholesomeness, in whatever way, through hearing, contemplation. This is important because the diligence many times is defined by how many hours you sit, how many quantities of mantras you have chant, how many, you know, days of austerity you have practiced, penance you have practiced, numbers like that, it doesn't really work like this. Diligence is how much joy you have. Like, you know, we have joy in browsing website. Past midnight, till sunrise, watching movies, playing cards, I don't know, gambling, hanging around with people. There's a joy. The moment you have the opportunity, you wake up. You, you become very perky and you become very active. If you have that inbuilt, the joy to be virtuous, joy to be compassionate, loving, kind, then we are talking about diligence. I will quickly go through this because I think we need to um, talk about some other aim. Then next is the samadhi. Something. Focus. Concentration. What is it? We will talk about this more, so just briefly. Basically, Meditation, the quintessence of the meditation is non-distracted. You know, the ab ability, ability to be non-distracted. And this goes with 
even the most mundane situation. If you are drinking a cup of tea, and as you drink the cup of tea, if you are only drinking that, and if you are not distracted to what's next, believe it or not, you have done a samadhi. Believe it or not, you have done a meditation. Short it may be, but really good. Much, much, much better than sitting hours and hours on the cushion and drifting, your mind drifting here and there. Might as well be conscious, be aware, and cognize what is happening right this very moment. Whatever action you are um, engaged with, whatever thought you are think you, you are having, as long as you are not distracted, then that is the conditions of the samadhi. Okay, now the wisdom, most important. Again, right now, briefly, I will introduce wisdom in Buddhism is not mere intellect. Wisdom is not byproduct of a lot of learning also. Wisdom is an, an ability to not fall into duality. That is the real wisdom. <coughs> I'm not only talking about non-judgmental. Non-judgmental is a sort of a technique, but an ability to be non-dual. Like, you see a beautiful rainbow, you are so happy, you take a selfie, but that's it. <coughs> At that time, you have a wisdom here. Of course, it's a very mediocre wisdom. What kind of wisdom do you have? You know, it's just a rainbow. Yes, you also can see it's so beautiful. But you will not go there with a chainsaw to cut it and keep it in. You know, you understand? So you are free from the ignorance of thinking the rainbow is real. There you have a little bit of a non-dual, like that. So but if you can apply that kind of awareness, that kind of attitude towards praise, criticism, happiness, suffering, gain, loss, if you can, if you can treat, treat these as rainbow, as beautiful as rainbow, but at the same time as illusion, Ill illusory as a rainbow, then you have a, what we call in Buddhism non, uh, the wisdom. But this is, of course, not that easy to achieve right away. So there's a lot of procedure which we will talk, hopefully. How many days we have? <laughs> huh? Two days more. Okay. Um, okay, so with this, let me say we have finished with a Dharma practitioner, but a kind of a, a common Dharma practitioner's um, attitude and a view or approach. Jebu chungugi lam, we say. You want to have a higher birth. Now, Sakipa, master, like Dr. Gyatsen, Sachin Kunganyangbo, they will say, you are, you still don't have a renunciation mind. Why? Because you are attached to these lofty, perfect life. So then we go to the next one. But before that, maybe I'll let you ask questions. questions. OK, yes. please. Yes, hi, Rupta. Thank you. I, I have a couple of questions. One yes. is, you know, we keep on mentioning suffering and in, in that Buddhism is not for happiness. 
So how do we know that the struggle is working and how do we utilize it in our, in our path? For example, uh, you know, how do we use the mass ingredients for awakening? And the other one is uh, when we accept the truth of impermanence... Wait, wait can, you, um, how do, can you ask that again? Yes, yeah, so for example, we keep on mentioning suffering and that Buddhism is not for happiness. So mm. how is it that we know that the suffering is working? You know, and, and use it for ingredients. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is, for example... Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think um, you are right. It's not, a, it's not a good strategy. We should not use this. <laughs> I've realized this. Of course, we need to know what... Do, what what do we mean by happiness? You understand? And I think we listed quite a lot this morning. Well, I have to still say, Buddhism ultimately is not for all of that. But I think... <coughs> okay, anyway, I'll answer your question. Well, how, how is suffering working? Yes. It's quite interesting. Mm. You know, Buddhists believe that the human beings, Buddhists believe that the human beings have are human beings are the best vessel to practice Dharma. And one of the reasons is They are not too happy like heavenly beings, you understand? <laughs> At the same time, they are also not too suffering like a hell beings. And there is a message there. Because I think when you are totally in pain and suffering, then again you lose some sort of a sensibility. You, you, you become so occupied by that suffering. But when you are so happy, you become numb. So supposedly the human beings have this sort of awareness that they suffer and then, you know, you know the sadness that we are talking about earlier? Human beings can also feel this sadness. So suffering therefore ends up becoming a cause to make you want liberation. Remember I said yesterday, Shantadeva's quotation, Dungal never shidun do Devi Mobadomija. He said, just... Okay, you know, remember, I was asking the question, why would you want enlightenment? I guess, briefly I can explain, because we do not want to suffer. So, absence of the suffering, like nyang de, nyang en le de, the word nyang en le de is like gone beyond the suffering or pain. So, absence of suffering, of course, is, is the, we are talking about many, many different suffering. So, when you have the suffering, it can trigger you not want to go beyond that. So, from that point of view. And just my, my second part on, you know, when we accept the truth of impermanence, how is it that by using this acceptance, you know, how can we use this acceptance for the benefit of other beings? Mm, this one I didn't get it. Can you say it again? Is it, you know, when, when we accept the truth of impermanence, you know, then how, and you know, how, after we acknowledge this acceptance, how is it that we can utilize this for the benefit of other beings if everything is impermanent? Oh, in many ways. Um, I, probably I didn't get your question thoroughly, but you can make people realize the impermanence because most of the suffering comes from not knowing that things are impermanent. You understand? 
also it's not always a, like a, it's not always like dark and dim and you know what do you call it um, gray you can also encourage sentient beings other beings by uh, mentioning the imper impermanence because things are impermanent things can be improved things can be changed you don't have to be stuck with one situation okay Did there are some please whoever has the mic Uh, I just wanted to ask you if you had any advice for a for mediocre Buddhist practitioners who always like to be busy. Who always like to be busy? Yes. Oh, I already told you. Just like Buddha Dharma. Is not enough. See, no. you want to. Be, that's yes. not enough. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then how about you know all the other things that I've been mentioning. How about like once a month stuff? Not enough? Okay. Then once a day? Can you do it? Yeah, like that. You 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 think it's too what ordinary or something? Why you are not satisfied with this? This this is this is important that we discuss this. Why you why you are not satisfied? I what? need to do something else. <laughs> you have what? That itchiness. <laughs> and then, because you want to do. Yes. <laughs> Impatient. Yes. I see. Okay. Then we will have path four. Remember, more less common and the least common coming. But for most of us, I would advise what we have been talking is really good. It's so good. It's safe. <laughs> and it's really good. Okay. Uh, Rinpoche, uh, talking about the generosity and patience, I like the idea of generosity and patience, and I want to be a generous and patient person. But I don't actually want to practice generosity or patience. Uh, I notice when I'm not being generous and giving somebody something, or I'm being impatient immediately, but then I just continue with it anyway. So how to not fall into the trap of self-help by being like, well, I should be generous and patient. And how does that come naturally? In fact, out of the six paramitas, the only thing I like to do is the meditation one. The rest, I mean, wisdom. The rest kind of all seem a little self-helpy. Self-healthy? Self-helpy. Self-helpy. Hmm. Because, can you give me the reason why? Uh, okay, for example, um, if I'm wearing something nice like a bangle and someone's like, oh, that's such a pretty bangle, my first instinct is to give it to them. And then I'm like, well, I kind of just really want that bangle. And so I don't. So. <laughs> I don't want to give it to them, but I want to be a generous person. You should not. I, 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 I've said this already. This is Shantideva already said this. You should give him a, a, one piece of grape. <laughs> Remember? I've said this. You have to begin with, you know. But I want to be enlightened in this lifetime. Is a grape enough? <laughs> ah, I see. <laughs> yeah. Your question is your answer. Now, now, then you are talking about different things. Then we are talking about pff, the least common practitioner. Now, then you, yeah, then, then we will talk about that. Still, you can keep Bengal. <laughs> and anyway, when we reach to that level, you giving Bengal is not going to do <coughs> much make much difference anyway when you reach to that level. So can I just practice the paramitas that I like and the rest will come? Yes, you can also. See, you are going back and forth. 
and you should, you can you are allowed you can why don't you become the buddhist at uh, buddhism admirer from 8 a.m to 9 a.m <laughs> and then buddhist from uh, uh, until 10 <laughs> and then uh, what you call practitioner of the most common uh, the throughout the days Okay. And then, yeah, I'm serious. People do that. There is actually a, there is actually a, what do you call it, instructions like that. And it's really healthy. It's good that we are discussing this because many, many, and this is what I mentioned right at the beginning, those who, and this is why we are also choosing, you know, just as a joke, the word Hina Mudra. Because we don't want to, you know, because many things, many go grab the highest. <coughs> and then they don't really think about this, these things. But, you know, it's a bit like this. Your emotion, part of your emotion wants the quickest, the greatest, the fastest. But also, the other part, you want to be in a place where they sell Panadol. Yes. Oh, sorry, second part, Rupati. Yeah? Um, I believe in karma and cause and effect. And so when I have negative emotions, I would like to not act them out because of karma. But in that moment of strong anger or strong impatience, um, I need some sort of reminder that's not a mantra or not something like all compounded things are impermanent. Can you toss out something that you compose or you say that's like a slap in the face to me that stops me from saying sharp words or something that I can remember that's from you and not some theory or mantra or something. Okay. <laughs> Let me think about something. Thank you. And I'll come back tomorrow for this. Can you remind me? Yes. I'm sure we can find something. Okay. Hello, Dimitri. Sorry, I have uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one, I was spending a lot of hours and hours on WeChat every day, and uh, sometimes I just feel uh, guilty, but I just still feel guilty every day. So do you have any advice on this? And uh, also, I believe do this... You feel guilty for spending hours uh, in WeChat? Yeah, because I lost the time to do the drama practice. Yes, I understand. <laughs> I have... <laughs> I really, I have, what, I resonate? <laughs> I resonate with you. Recently, I read Murakami's, what? I, IQ, IQ 89, right? 84, is it? Yeah. After reading, I had a post Murakami reading depression. It's like 2,000 pages of useless thing, but that's what happens. Yeah, I think it's try to, uh, what's the best way to find the balance of those between uh, Buddhism and normal? Okay, uh, try this one. <laughs> Let's try this one. Um, make a time. I'm um, no, no, no. no. Can you try to send at least 100 messages to people every hour? <laughs> I'm serious. No matter what. Hi, 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 like that. Uh, I don't think I can do that. What? <laughs> I don't think I can do that. Too much for me. Exactly. Can you do that? Try. Uh, okay, uh, how about like 80 times? 80, one hour? Yeah, within one hour. Okay, I will try. Anyway, you would be with WeChat anyway. You okay. said. Okay, so what's the purpose of sending 100 <laughs> every hour? Because you want to be in the WeChat, which you are. I'm not taking you from that. But at the same time, you know, asking you to do something but a routine, routine and deliberate, probably it may make you not want to do it. Yeah, yeah, I got it. So. Okay. If you eat something too much, you maybe don't like maybe, it Maybe, maybe. Right? But it might not work after one week. <laughs> so we have to apply another one. Okay. Uh, 
uh, my second question is, uh, is that possible for us to uh, take the refugee to uh, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha in the next two days? Yes, yes, we are going to do this on the last day. Okay, thank you very much. In that shrine. Okay. Rinpoche? Yes. I have a question about um, being a common practitioner. In the way you explained it, um, it works for someone that already has a certain degree of faith. But what about somebody who's interested in the Buddhist teaching and on the verge? They might hear something like this and say, this is no different than any other faith-based religion. So how is this different than, you know, basically if you take refuge in Jesus, you'll go to heaven. Um, this favorable rebirth. And, and how does it actually work? Yeah, I, I, I think I understand what you are saying. But I think we talked about this, remember? There is a some, you know, even though we know Sometimes in the you know Nyingma pas they use the word denpi thekpa. I think they, the word is kunjung denpi thekpa. They use this is kind of an important word. Denpi thekpa means is there is a connotation that this vehicle is designed to take you from here to here, but the fine there's another another aim. There's a hidden agenda to take you further. <coughs> You, yourself, don't want to go to the further. You don't, can't even fathom it. You can only fathom this, the Panadol bit. You understand? So this vehicle then promises that, hey, I can take you from here to this Panadol land. You got it? Um, but the vehicle itself has the ingredient of things like all compounded things are impermanent, all things do not have inherently existing nature, therefore you should behave, you know? You know, that in the lower, in the more higher, they don't really, more and more you go higher, they really don't talk about your behavior so much. I mean, they do, but they talk in a much more different way. Um, it's also, I think I've said this, Sonam Mahim Tangboto, um, Buddha's first strategy is to divert you from non-virtuous thoughts and actions because that's an immediate issue. Uh, did I answer your question? Is that what you were asking? S yeah? Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, you know, what would you say to someone who doesn't yet believe in reincarnation? and has some doubts about it, but wants to become a, a common practitioner. I see. Is there a way? Okay. Yeah. That, that's an important question. And I think we, I've been thinking about this. In Asia, within Tibetans and probably Chinese, probably Indians, um, what do you call it? The tools to jumpstart your spiritual path, or what do you call it? Uh, whip, if you like. Hey, you better practice, otherwise this, you know, whip. In Asia, in like Tibetan, Chinese, the reincarnation works, and karma works. N probably it won't work in the West, so you don't need to use this whip. You understand? So then what do you use? I, I think you should use, oh, everything is your projection, mm. stuff like this. Everything is your projection. Things that does not have inherently existing nature. You know, modern people need to know what, what is there in it for you. So then you can say, well, you know, well, obviously they should have suffering. You understand? This is why the suffering is important. Someone even asked me whether AI can practice Dharma. And my answer is, as long as the AI have all those, remember, the ordinary being d definition, yeah, they can. It doesn't matter whether the being have come out from mother's womb or 
arise from a laboratory, it doesn't matter. This is just a difference of birth. You understand? So you could use the whip of everything as your projection. Probably for the modern people, this works better. You understand? And once, now, once you have a conviction that everything is your projection, things does not have inherently existing nature, then next step is you will then begin to respect the relative truth. You got it? You begin to respect the relative truth. You know? Once you begin to respect the relative truth, then you will begin to think, oh yeah, reincarnation exists just as a head exists on my neck. Because they are equally relative. They are equally a projection. Because after all, Buddha never said there is a reincarnation on the ultimate level. And the relative means what? In the what? What's the word? My memory is not good. Sanskrit word of relative, uh, samrit, uh, relative truth. Smriti, samriti, 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 raba, samriti. Deeper che pa singe chigo marve. Deeper che. The Sanskrit word samriti has this connotation of deceiving you. You know, deceiving you like a. Um, like, a, like a forest, you see, a, you know, like gathering of a lot of green, you understand? And then notion of forest. But the idea of forest does not, ex I mean, there is no such thing as an independent, independent entity called forest. It's all like many, many trees come together. So, but it still deceives you by thinking that there is a big forest behind us, like that. So, samriti, there is a, that. So, relative truth is a samriti. It, it deceives you. It makes you think it exists. And it has many ways, things like... Um, So, so then, so, okay, so the, for the Tibetans, for the, for the Chinese, for Indian maybe, not the, mo not the modern Indians, not the modern Tibetans, I may use, oh, you better behave, because there's something called karma, there's something called reincarnation, as the whip or as the jump start to lure them to the Dharma, and then introduce them to the Shunyata, dependent arising, bodhicitta, ultimate bodhicitta. And for someone who is modern, I don't know, someone who is not with the culture of this reincarnation and karma, I may use the uh, means of everything is your projection as a jump start, and then take you to reincarnation. Because you cannot underestimate relative truth. Remember? Otherwise, just go and read, read Nietzsche. That will do it. <laughs> okay. Who has the mic? Yeah. Yes. Okay, Rinpoche. Uh, yesterday you told uh, 10 points. So uh, can you clarify, clarify the three and the four? So, uh, the three said, use yourself as an example and no harm others. And the four said, you are your own master and your own enemy. Can you please explain, clarify a little bit? Okay, I kind of forgot. Uh, the, what, was, what was the first? Use yourself as an example oh, and no harm um, others. Okay, got it. Rangi lui la pelon la jena ne pa majijik. Yeah, that's it. Mm, um, okay, that's quite a profound one actually. It's really deep, this one. This one has a lot of commentary, by the way. Mm, because really, it's, it's really, really meticulous, if you want to go really meticulously. Because, okay, how do you define harm? Usually, it's very subjective. 
let's say you go to Jupiter, and let's say there are human, uh, Jupiter beings, and for them, hugging is unbearable suffering. You understand? Now, if you know, but you are a human being, you like to be hugged. You understand? And then you hug them. The moment you see this Jupiter friend, you hug them. You are not harming them. Because you don't know. Let's say the Jupiter guys really want to be want, uh, being punched. <laughs> and then you have read now, because you are matured, you read about what Jupiter likes and they don't like. So you have to punch. Because this is what they like. You understand? It's a bit like this. So you, but on the ordinary level, how do you judge what is harming someone? You always use yourself as an example or a reference point. What do you don't like if you do it to others? Because why do we, first of all, why do we punch somebody? Because you know when you are punched, you don't like it. And you are doing that to somebody to cause pain. You understand? So that's a coming from somebody who came 2,500 years ago. It's a very impressive statement, I would say. Okay, what was the second one? The second one is the four. Uh, you are your own master and you are your own enemy. Oh, no, no. You are your own master. Who else can be your master? That's Rangi Rangi Goenji Shani Suji Gondaji. Yeah, you are your own master. Yeah, that's. By the way, it's not really the same as the individual rights. <laughs> you understand? Uh, I don't know, I should be mentioning these things because I'm already sort of in a trouble these days. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? But it is really nothing to do with the individual rights. Mm, of course, I'm not saying that I do not respect individual rights, so don't edit my speech again here. <laughs> you understand? Uh, basically, your mind is the only one that will do the projecting. You are the architect. I think there's a very beautiful phrases. Just, I think the conversation between, okay, Shakyamuni Buddha, after six years of penance, goes to the Mangada under the Bodhi tree. He's about to be enlightened. Lord Mara comes. And the Mara, and he has a conversation. And there's a beautiful conversations about architect, architect. And it's really, really important. I mean, it's a really beautiful. It really talks about how yourself, your mind is an architect constructing everything. Uh, everything. Your, your values, your, your whatever. Um, your values, your goal, your path, your likes, dislikes, your individual rights also projected by your mind. So that's what we are talking here. Okay, the next one. Ooh, yeah. Uh, Rinpoche, uh, thinking about this question, if uh, is enlightenment attractive for me? Uh, I've tried to ponder this question and, and what I find is there's only my projections about enlightenment. Like I think it's this, I think it's that, I think it's not this, I think it's not that, but it's not really what I found is, I don't know what is enlightenment. Very is, good. Yeah? So, Very so, so good. what to do ne next? Uh, yes, that's know. what I'm saying. So all, all you need to think about is you, your wish to not suffer. That you, you obviously you should have, no? Yeah. That's something that you should bang onto. Not, you know, kofang, we call it the state of no cessation of suffering. This is why, again, back to the lady's question, the usage of suffering, it's a really important one. I repeat this, huh? Shanta Devas, Dungal Nyevar Shidendu Trevi Mongka Domija. 
I will translate this very loosely. For the time being, you keep one ignorance. And what is that? Thinking that there is an enlightenment. Why should I? Because you don't want to suffer. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, could you comment a little bit on the word joy, which is so frequently used, especially in the Dharma books translated into English? Is it, is it to be understood just as cessation of suffering or a kind of emotion? And is it actually based on a Sanskrit word, the word joy? Are you talking about the love, compassion and the joy? Um, yeah, I'm more Go. talking about all these books like Joy of Living, Joy of whatever. <laughs> so the word joy, if it has a font in like a Sanskrit word. And because okay. before you also said... Um, this, um, this joy is, yeah, can be, I think... Um, I know some people use Deva as also joy. But I think you are talking about the third of the immeasurable thoughts, which we, were, we are going to talk. It is actually something to do with uh, rejoice. Mm, actually, one of, the, one of the 20 different reasons why we are ordinary is... Um, Let me translate this. It's very nice. Um, uh, sentient beings are not not clever enough, not savvy. Yeah, sentient beings are not savvy, clever, shrewd enough to grab the ready-made happiness. And what is that? When you see somebody having fun, when, when you see somebody have a beautiful earring or something, I don't know, whatever, there is a chance to grab, a, you know, instant ready-made joy for, wow, how nice that she has this or he has this. You understand? So that's what it is. Uh, it's in there. Basically, sentient beings have this, some sort of inbuilt envy, envy. Um, so in the immeasurable thoughts, it's a bit like this. Um, so there there. So if somebody is not suffering, when somebody is having fun, happy, then you wish that they will never lose that. That's the exercise. I think that's maybe what you are talking about. Okay, next one. Whoever has the mic, yeah, please. Uh, remember, Che, in general, there are two kinds of uh, a bodhicitta, which is uh, relative and absolute. So what do I think? It's by realizing the absolute one, we, it's, it's all of us to become a very compassionate and loving to others in a very, let's say, a natural way. So why should we growing up the relative one first? Yeah, that's my question. I see. Because the ultimate bodhicitta is, um, I mean, you know, there's no reason you don't go there. But chances of conceptualizing the ultimate bodhicitta is very high. Because we are creature of conceptualization. You understand? We just, just can't help but to conceptualize. So, yes, by all means, aspire to go to the ultimate bodhicitta. In fact, I always promote ultimate bodhicitta with the relative bodhicitta because the reason is there is a tendency to forget the ultimate bodhicitta and if you take that out, 
so-called the relative bodhicitta will become very theistic and very religious and is very limited. Yeah. But relative bodhicitta is doable. For instance, may all sentient beings be happy. You see? It's easier for common people. But wow, no nose, no ears, no no enlightenment, no this, no that. It's on the intellectual level easy, but difficult. So, but uh, is it can be the way to growing up the absolute one first? I mean. Oh, yes, there is. It's possible. Yes, it is very possible. You have to accumulate a lot of merit, though. Yeah. Thank you very much. And that accumulation of merit, the main force of accumulation of that merit is wanting. You need to want. You really need to want the ultimate bodhicitta. No matter what, <coughs> this will accumulate merit. Wanting this. No matter what, you will trade thousand kilos of gold with one word of ultimate bodhicitta. Like this. Can okay, here. Maybe. Oh, can okay. I ask a question? Yes. Okay. Where, where, yeah. Rinpoche, thank you for your teaching. Um, when you were talking the first day about a half an hour where we are not. Um, in, uh, not blessing people with our presence, right? Being a rec like a recluse, isolated. Uh, we're from Seattle, so that's very easy to do. Right? Okay. But I want to know, does that include no social media for that half an hour? It's up to you. <laughs> it's really up to you. Probably. Yes. Okay. Probably. And then um, along that vein, uh, I see so many, especially kids and young adults, not really connecting with others. It's very easy to become isolated and only connect digitally. Do you have some insights about that? Oh, yeah. Well, that kind of isolation is a little bit different, by the way. That kind of isolation is... Can I make a note? Because this is kind of important, so we will talk about this tomorrow. Will you be here? Okay. Alienation. Is that what you are talking about? Yes. A big modern problem. Alienation. It's very strange. I don't know why the self wants to be alienated. Okay. Uh, you spoke of what makes me ordinary today. If my inattentive mind has heard you correctly earlier, in your earlier teachings, you also mentioned another kind of ordinariness. Uh, people who are not affected too much by intellectual concepts. So you also spoke of that kind of ordinariness. Is there any difference between the two? Oh, I see. Yeah, the word ordinary is dis. I think we are talking about the very special ordinary, isn't it? Yeah. Well, of course, that's extraordinary. No, that one we talk later. Uh, Can you remind me? <laughs> yeah. I've been struggling to. Sosu uh... chevo is the word. I will try to find the word in Sanskrit. Can somebody help? Sosu chevo is the. Okay. I've been struggling to understand this um, the non hierarchical nature of the two realities, the ultimate and the relative. Mm -hmm. um, and even to frame the question is very difficult for me. Um, but what I want to ask is the mind that realizes ultimate reality mm -hmm. is non dual, but the mind which appreciates relative truth is dual. It has to be dual because it has to think of this and that. Right. How can the two minds be equal? Okay. Are you tricking me here? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Really? <laughs> no, no, I understand. Okay, it's like this. 
Um, first of all, relative truth and ultimate truth does not exist on ultimate level. Then it's <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yes. <laughs> okay, I think we we'll stop here. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, one more, one more. Okay. Yes. Um, you talk about how to define ordinary beings, and there's one point you said that never know. I'm not, I didn't do a good translation. I, uh, yeah, okay, anyway, you so can. So one uh, point I want more clarification. One is that never know the direction and nature and state of fearlessness. They are magic bichola, hango. Wait. Basically, what it really means is, as Maitreya said, we just love troubles. You understand? We've been told stay out of trouble, but we don't. We love it. We love things that are scary. We just, we don't even know. Is there? Yeah, please, show me. What's the Sanskrit word? Sosicho. Prathakjana? 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 Is the Sanskrit word? The ordinary Sosicho. Tsural Tonga is also quite good. Can you try to find the word Tsural Tonga? Tsural Tonga. Maybe we can discuss this tomorrow. Okay. Um, should I move? <laughs> Why not? I'm not singing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, as long. Yeah. Can you switch this off?